Okay, uh, Jonathan and I go back to about, I think it was 2006 at an IVF conference in Orlando. We happened to cross paths and have uh, stayed in contact and even done a little collaboration in the years since. Cross paths but, is a good way of putting it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we will, um, why don't we just go ahead and get started with you? We're, we're on time. Sounds good. Can you see that deck all right? Yep, you're coming through. Okay, well, thanks, Mike, for the uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, yeah, indeed, Mike and I do go back a long way and have collaborated. Um, and I was excited about the opportunity to uh, jump into this newly created practitioner track um, because I think uh, there's there's a ton of amazing content that comes out of ISF conferences and. I think one of the challenges sometimes as practitioners uh, is we go in, we see all these cutting edge ideas, uh, and, and then when it comes time to uh, put them into practice back at the home office, there's sometimes a little bit of a gap. Um, and uh, so, so I'm excited to be speaking as a practitioner first, um, but I'm also particularly excited to be talking about this topic. Um, demand planning has been a passion of mine for a, a while, a passion and a profession. Um, but in particular, in the last few years, what we're, what we're really interested in is in those instances um, where uh, a statistical forecast or a computer driven forecast may not be the best approach um, and, and where there is a need for human judgment. Um, there's, there's a ton of research. Paul Goodwin's been at the forefront of a lot of that research showing that humans are just not as good as we as we think we are at adding value to forecasts. Um, but when we find ourselves in times like we do now, uh, during a global pandemic, when a lot of historic demand patterns are kind of out the window, um, we, we're increasingly going to human judgment. And, and what I'm going to be talking about for the next roughly 20 to 25 minutes, so we have time for questions, is uh, it, it's an ambitious agenda because I want to introduce what is behavioral economics? How does, it, how does it apply to demand planning? Um, where is the best place for judgment in, in forecasting, knowing what we know about behavioral economics? Um, but then, uh, more importantly, what do we do as practitioners when we get back to the home office? Because it's great to understand the problems, but what can we do to solve them? Um, so because of the limited amount of time we have, um, when we talk about some of the bigger concepts like the, the, the time and the place for, for judgment, I can address questions uh, if they come up, but, but you'll have to trust me for now that I'm not saying anything that hasn't been heavily researched. Uh, I just don't have time to get into a lot of the research because of the, the agenda that we've got. So right off the top, what are we talking about when we talk about uh, behavioral economics? Well, the gentleman on the top left of this slide, Adam Smith, uh, forms essentially the basis of neoclassical economic thought on decision making. And that is that humans are essentially rational. And when we're based with clear value based choices, we'll choose the highest value option. And, and, and those of you who are economists will think of this in terms of utility, but essentially it's the same thing. It doesn't have to be highest value in terms of money. If, if I see multiple options rationally, I'm going to choose the one that has the greatest value to me. Um, Prices get set in marketplaces between this relationship that results from demand and supply. And in those cases, when consumers act outside this model, we call them irrational, um, which is convenient uh, if you're an economist and your model doesn't work. Um, about 40 years ago, no, more like 50 years ago, we're coming on, um, Daniel Kahneman, who's the gentleman at the bottom right of this slide, and his long-term collaborator, Amos Tversky, uh, who are psychologists, not economists, did a number of experiments um, that began to shine a light into the gap between how we in decision-making in, in neoclassical economics explain human decision-making and how increasingly we see it actually unfold in real life. If, uh, if humans are doing things that economists call irrational, Kahneman and Tversky had 
a psychological insight into why some of those things happen. So their argument fundamentally is that economic decision-making can be better explained in terms of psychology surrounding and underlying the decision than in terms of this very straightforward rational interpretation of decision-making. Um, and, and what's key is that a lot of these underlying decision-making factors are unconscious. These are the slides you're going to have to trust me on. I'm going to leave the deck for anyone who's interested. I'm happy to speak uh, to anyone who has questions afterwards, but we just don't have time to dive into it. But at the end of the day, what, what Tversky and Kahneman were talked about were a set of sort of overarching heuristics or mental shortcuts that all of us as humans have. Uh, and they essentially fall into these three categories. If you're interested, I've, I've given the article references at the base of the slide. The first really seminal article that ultimately won uh, Kahneman the Nobel Prize for economics was Judgment Under Uncertainty. And, and, and here's where he begins to understand humans are not nearly as good at making rational, objective decisions in uncertain situations as we think we are. That's pretty key because when we're talking about forecasting, we're talking about uncertainty. We're talking about making a guess at the future. And th these three mental shortcuts, representativeness, availability, and adjustment and anchoring, basically explain the ways that we think we're being rational, but because of these unconscious processes, that rationality falls short. What they began to discover over the next decade of their research is that expected utility theory, or the idea that we're rational in our decision making, falls short not only because of these cognitive dysfunctions, but also because people aren't, uh, aren't identical in, in the relationship they have between risk and reward. The, the relationship between risk and reward is not linear. It's asymmetric and nonlinear. And essentially, we're more afraid of losing things than we feel good about getting things. And that's key when it comes time to understand um, some of these cognitive dysfunctions that take place when we think we're making rational decisions. Another thing we do really badly that has a big impact on forecasting is intertemporal discounting. Um, we're not really good at objectively looking at the value of things in the future, even if it's pointed out to us mathematically. There's this subconscious process that takes place where we, we reduce the implied value of these things the more that they, they exist in the future. Uh, anyone interested can look at Richard Thaler, another uh, Nobel winning economist, uh, in his work, uh, Mental Accounting Matters in 1999. We come by these frailties, uh, honestly, um, we're the only animal that has a prefrontal cortex. And this is the part of the brain up here that allows us to think rationally and objectively about the future and about abstract thoughts. The problem is it doesn't stop growing until we're in our mid twenties, which means for the first two and a half decades of our life, we've been making decisions without it. Um, thinking we're being rational, but being uh, using the dopamine response center, which is more impulsive and reactive. And that serves us very well from an evolutionary standpoint, because if a tiger is coming out of the bushes at us, we don't want to have to stop and consider its vector and the various different op options we've got to, to mitigate the situation. We just want to really quickly get out of the way. But the problem is because we so often are using that part of the brain in what should be the objective and rational kind of decision-making that takes place in, in forecasting, we, we uh, lose the value of that prefrontal cortex that's there for this specific purpose. It takes practice to engage it. Um, anyone who's read Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow um, will be familiar with this, and anyone who hasn't uh, might consider giving it a read. Again, we're at a very quick pace here. I, I apologize, but I want to make sure we, we get to what does this all mean for demand planning? Well, there's a lot of well-documented um, research showing us the value of stats-driven forecasting. Um, and, and especially when you consider the number of frailties in human judgment, it, it seems like, and in, in fact, Kahneman would be one of the ones to say it, don't let humans do what a computer should do. Computers don't have biases. Uh, at least not statistical biases. Um, they're able to make effective use of complex data. They can differentiate between noise and patterns. Um, and, and basically the major drawback for a computer is they can't predict what hasn't already happened. And, and this is really where we find the place for judgment in forecasting. In situations where 
um, the past can't be used as a good predictor of the future, we might want to consider engaging human judgment here. We are responsive to changes and we can anticipate changes in the market landscape in, in ways that computers at present aren't very effective at doing. We can sometimes identify one-off events and we're capable of drawing from, very, from many different areas of expertise. But the problem is, even when we think we're being objective, we're riddled with these unconscious biases. We get over-influenced by recent events, we underestimate future impacts, um, we misunderstand causal relationships, we mistake stochastic patterns for systemic, we think we see patterns where they don't exist, we can't, we can't process nearly as much data as we think we can, we have individual biases, we have group dynamics, and what that all means is basically don't let humans get involved in the forecasting process unless you absolutely have to. And once you have to, be aware of these systemic biases and look for ways to mitigate. And we'll come to that in a moment. But as a, a, a quick and easy way to, to look at where and when we should consider human judgment in forecasting, um, apart from if we know something specifically about the future that doesn't exist in the past data, that would be obviously a a good place to start. But secondly, if, if we map a portfolio looking at its forecastability, where the coefficient of variation of its demand um, gives us some indication of how forecastable that will be using statistical means, and the other component of that scatter plot would be its financial importance to the company or its, its, its gross profit contribution. The parts that exist over here on the right-hand side of this breakpoint are less forecastable using strictly speaking statistical methods. The ones that exist below the horizontal breakpoint in this matrix represent the bottom 20% of profit contribution, which means that although there might be a, a, a reason for humans to get involved in the planning of some of these, the return on investment is probably gonna be relatively low. And for any of you that are actual practitioners and not academics, ROI matters more than the, than the pursuit of forecasting perfection. So it's this sweet spot up here in the top where statistically, these are gonna be more difficult to forecast. They could be project-based uh, items where uh, human input is gonna be a lot more valuable than, than just using history. But also the profit contribution represents the top 80% to the bottom line. So here's where you'd spend some time, get some inputs because the ROI is going to make it worthwhile. Getting involved in, in parts that have a relatively stable coefficient of variance is, and again, we have decades of research. Paul Goodwin is a great, uh, a great uh, author on this topic for any of you who haven't read it already. A lot of research shows us that where humans get their fingerprints on parts that should be statistically forecasted for a host of behavioral scientific reasons, we make the forecasts worse. So, I wanna talk really briefly before getting to mitigations about what some of these specific biases in planning look like. Um, and they can exist not only just in the forecasting process, but they can exist in the decisions we make to um, override the stat baseline, in what business intelligence inputs we bring in, in what macroeconomic inputs we choose to integrate, on what action we, we, we take on the forecast afterwards, and indeed even in, in the data preparation itself, whether or not to include uh, certain outliers. There's human judgments that are taking place all throughout the forecasting process. So my team worked with a number of large multinationals over the last couple of years. Um, and uh, I believe it was the last issue of Foresight. We published some of these findings. So again, I'm going to go quickly, but anyone that's interested, it's in, it's in the April edition of Foresight. Um, and we worked with a just, just around 600 demand planners around the world uh, from big and small companies and, and put them through a set of uh, exercises that were originally conceived by Tversky and Kahneman. We updated some of the language. And what we found was um, the, the biases that they'd measured for originally in the 1970s are even more prevalent in demand planners. So, so one, of the, one of the biggest and baddest is, is overconfidence. Um, and the reason I think it's particularly uh, bad is because this one sort of tends to exacerbate some of the other biases that we see. Overconfidence 
is that that set of biases that are rooted in an unjustified certainty in legitimacy of one's opinions. Um, it makes a person less open to getting additional information that might change their mind. It makes them less open to, to feedback and considering other perspectives. And in three quarters of the demand planners that we examined, they had a degree uh, of overconfidence and this exceeds the, the, the non-demand planning population. That actually moderates a bit as experience increases. So the less experience one has, and this is demonstrated over here in, with the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, the less experience one has, the more certain one is of being right. Um, cluster illusion bias, which I mentioned earlier, um, this is where we think we can see patterns where they don't exist. Um, again, about three quarters of the people we looked at who are professional demand planners exhibited some degree of cluster illusion bias. The framing effect was particularly striking. This is where the language used to describe data actually can change our opinion of what that data means. And, and what we did in this study was present a set of data without any story and, and ask the responders for their input on whether the trend was gonna go up, flat or, or decline over the next six months. And then we asked the same question later in the study but gave a story that really had no real relationship with the data. And what we found was three times more planners felt certain they could draw a certain conclusion in the framed example than the raw data example. And it also increased positive bias by about 300%. Now this is really important because this idea we have of objectivity kind of goes out the window uh, un unless uh, the data being fed to demand planners and organizations is being done in such a way that they basically have no human contact. Because with that human contact, invariably comes some frames. We tested for over 20 biases. I'm only gonna be talking about a couple right now just because of the time constraints, but this is another big one. Um, we saw that 54% of planners exhibited a persistent positive bias of which 39 overall had a strong positive bias. In other words, if we gave tre trend neutral data to, to demand planners, they would tend to see a positive outcome from it 54% um, of the time, even when it wasn't uh, supported by the data. This corroborates work that uh, Paul Goodwin previously did in, in, a, number, in, a, in a smaller uh, study of demand planners. So we tested for 20 biases. There are over a hundred. They all tie back to these same set of cognitive dysfunctions. We all have them. What do we do about it when we have to use human judgment? Because if COVID-19 has shown us anything, it's that there can't be a one size fits all approach to forecasting. Um, I'm, a, I'm a very strong proponent of using robust statistical methods to drive forecasts when possible, but there's just some cases where that isn't the best approach and humans have to be involved. And where humans have to be involved, we need to be aware of these, of these uh, the drawbacks of human judgment. So before I even start talking about FEA, and I'm only gonna spend a, a moment because Mike Gill and uh, who introduced me, for those of you who don't know, is, is basically the, the godfather of FEA and he could undoubtedly tell you uh, everything you need to know. The first and foremost way you can help to mitigate human biases in the forecasting process is to ensure you don't have humans involved where they shouldn't be. Going back to that forecastability matrix, if you've got a stable portfolio of parts and the expectation of the future hasn't changed from the history substantively, or at least in a way that you know definitively, humans shouldn't be touching those parts. They will not add value because of their biases. If you know something specific that's going to be different, or if demand patterns have begun to change and humans have to be involved, begin by at least measuring the biases. We found in some work we did recently with Walmart's Innovation Center that just by letting people know about their biases as a result of these individual bias assessments we did, that a lot of the bias um, mitigated. People went from thinking that they were unbiased and objective and purely rational to recognizing there were some, some frailties in the decision-making processes. And, and without even training them, we started to see some of those biases self-correct. So measuring the problem to begin with is, is from what we're seeing, one of the easiest ways to begin to fix it. But on top of that forecast value add, uh, and I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here. For those of you who are unaware, there's a lot of great resources online. Um, but essentially what forecast value add does is allow us to disaggregate forecasts into their core components. So rather than looking at the performance of the forecast in its entirety, 
we're seeing what elements of that forecast are adding value or taking it away. Irrespective if on the left side, you've got a very simple model or here on the right side, you've got a more complex model, we need to understand what is the, uh, what is the impact of each of these individual components. And by doing that, we're able to then begin to see, for instance, in this case, that when sales added their overrides to the process, they increased the overall error of the forecast by 5%. And that's on top of the customers who in this case increased the error by 15%. That, that allows us to begin to look at the root cause of where these errors are coming from and identify how biases are driving some of the, driving away what some of the value should be of these, of these insights. Uh, another great way to mitigate uh, the effect of unconscious biases is by selective screening and training. Now, this is a double-edged sword, and I'm going to come to the other edge on the next slide. Um, but one of the things that, that some of our clients asked us to do, um, and, and Heineken and Dell Technologies were two in particular, who had very big planning communities, and asked us if we were able to draw conclusions between personality types and certain bias prevalences. Um, and, and the answer uh, is, is absolutely yes. You might think that this would then um, indicate, well, there are certain personality types that, that I should be hiring for as demand planners because their biases are gonna be lower. And prima facie, that's true. Um, but there's a downside to that. And, and th there's all kinds of biases that result, organizational biases that result from people who all have the same personality. Um, Groupthink is, is one in particular that caused some pretty big problems in the past, like for instance, the Challenger disaster, um, the, the Yom Kippur War in 1973, great examples of groupthink, um, where because everyone comes from the same background and has the same personality, they think they're doing a great job by making decisions very quickly and all getting along with each other. But the problem is they're not considering other, other perspectives. So our conclusion from the fact that we can draw um, clear uh, connections between certain personality types and certain biases isn't don't hire certain personality types. It's be aware that certain personality types will have a, a higher prevalence of certain types of biases and help to train and mitigate those because the value of diversity is much, much greater than trying to um, select out certain personality types because we've all got biases. It's just some of us have more than others. Um, so I mentioned this already. Uh, again, not a lot of time to talk about the Everest expedition, but this is a great business school um, case study that some of you will be familiar with. And, and, and those of you who aren't, Google it. There's, there's a lot of resources online. But the, the spoiler basically is at the end of the, the Everest expedition, it's the groups who think they've collaborated super well that end up getting helicoptered off the mountain uh, because they've made bad decisions. They've made quick decisions and they've all gotten along, but that isn't the same as performance. So embracing different personality types helps to mitigate the, the effect of some of these group biases. Uh, golden rules for, for reducing bias and improving forecast performance. Again, just to, just to really re emphasize this, if you want to mitigate the, the damage that human cognitive dysfunction can make to a forecast, don't touch things that a computer should do. Uh, except in those cases where you know, this isn't assume, but you know specifically something different about the future. Um, don't use any inputs in your process that you don't measure. And this is one of the beauties of, of Forecast Value Add or FVA. It forces you to measure everything. If you aren't measuring what the impact of some of these inputs is on your forecast, it is undoubtedly having a, a negative effect. Do use your prefrontal cortex. Um, those who, who have known me as long as Mike do would probably not think that I'm the kind of person to talk about practicing increased mindfulness, um, but there's really no better way of putting it. This is what Kahneman talks about in, in thinking fast and slow. It's really taking the time to actively engage the other part of the mind, slow down, don't be reflexive and responsive and, and, and slowly consider um, the, the information that you're being presented. Um, 
do, tr do identify and train against biases in your organizations. You, you can't fix what you haven't measured. Uh, and, and again, our, our data is showing us that e even in the simple fact of measuring it and telling people about it, it begins to fix itself. And, and ultimately, uh, value diversity, because this helps to uh, safeguard against some of the group biases that are just as prevalent and just as damaging as individual biases. So I, I have essentially pulled together three topics, each of which that uh, I could easily spend uh, a lot of time talking about uh, and left us five minutes for, for questions that anybody might have. Hi, uh, John. Um, a question. I was intrigued by the forecast value add um, research you did. Yeah. Um, I wonder, have you ever tested it against like segmented to the types of change made, for example. Absolutely. Was the adjustment made upwards or downwards yes, that they yes. overshoot, undershoot, go the wrong direction? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a great question, uh, Stefan. Uh, and uh, the answer is, is absolutely yes. Um, and uh, it, it corroborates some of the research that, that Goodwin has found over the years. Um, a, we're, in general, we're, we're, we're three to four times more likely to make upward adjustments than downward adjustments, which, which falls right in line with our risk aversion, uh, the risk aversion component of prospect theory that Kahneman talked about. But in the cases where we do that, we're not adding value. We're, we're usually wrong when we do that. Um, we found that in our study and we find that in previous studies as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's a maturity model that I didn't have time to share here, but basically uh, step one is, you know, let's start by measuring the bias at all. And once we've done that, mm -hmm. let's start looking at forecast value add. But once we've done that, to your, to your question, let's now start drilling into, okay, planner by planner, decision by decision, let's understand the framework of what's making us better and what's making us worse. Um, a, I mean, full transparency, I like to keep humans out of the process wherever I can. So I, we do this to create a decision tree to show, listen, 80% of the decisions you're making are bad. And, and here's the data to back that up. Let a computer do that. But here's a few golden morsels that you are adding value in. And, and let's focus there if we can. And, and how have you uh, related that to the personalities of the, the planners? <laughs> uh, or is it more role-based? Certain roles do more of one versus another role. Uh, no, no, no. It's it's definitely it, there's definitely personalities. Um, I can maybe share more offline. Uh, and, and one of the reasons <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not being cagey intentionally. It's just what we found with the work we did with Walmart recently is we kind of overshared about how the study works. So when we had their planners do it, they, they knew too much. So we, we had all these people who looked super, super neutral. Um, and, and we knew it was just because we kind of uh, spilled the beans a bit, but I, I'd be happy to talk about it offline. I'd love to. Hey, we've got a question from Nikos. Yeah, thanks for the talks. Um, I, I found something that I hadn't actually considered before your talk. And you mentioned about the profiles of the demand planners. And I was thinking, if I would do wisdom of the crowd, I would like a diverse yes. set of profiles so that the bias actually cancel out. Yes. But I also get a lot of information. Now here we have different planners looking at different products, but they do still work as a team. Any ideas how that might work out? Yeah, it, it, it's a challenge. I'm a, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of the idea of the wisdom of the, of the crowd. Um, and, and I think there's certain applications. I mean, one of the challenges, as, as basically everyone on this call probably knows, in, in forecasting in the social sciences or, or forecasting in, in the imperfect world that consumers live in versus a scientific forecast is that we have so many variables, not just known variables, but unknown variables. So wisdom of the crowd really works well when NASA is asking someone to you know, reconfigure the solar panels on a, on a space station because it's, it's science-based, it's rules-based, and there's not a lot of variability. The problem that you've already hit on the head there is wisdom of the crowd does cancel out some of the biases, but for human judgment in, in business forecasting to work well, it, it needs to be predicated on the fact that they must know something about the product and the marketplace and, and, and the consumers. 
Um, and and I'm not sure where that where that intersection between wisdom of the crowd and having very domain specific knowledge can really exist. I think within an organization, you can get sort of wisdom of a mini crowd. And, and that's where I think casting a broad net internally uh, for people who know things about your market works well. But um, I, I'd be lying if I said, I, I've got a clear line of sight to where that exists sort of in, in more general terms. Does that make sense? Quite a bit, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Okay. I, I don't, I don't either because as you say that it's 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 not exactly the same problem and yeah exactly yeah hey we're at the top of the hour um but we don't there's not an immediately following session if anybody has any anything else bring it up now or uh, again just follow up with jonathan afterwards oh yeah i should i'll advance the slide so now you've got my email address yeah, always, always happy to discuss this topic. Stefan, I'll follow up with you and, and, and happy to share more of the details. Um, incidentally, one of the clients, and I won't mention which, was also interested in understanding gender uh, specific biases. Um, and I don't love talking about that in an open forum either because th there's a difference. Uh, the types of biases that we tended to see amongst the 600 planners who were male versus female, uh, to be clear, what I'm not saying is one performed better than the other, not at all, but there was definitely a difference in the types of biases. So that was also interesting. Hey, with that, why don't we wrap this up for the night? And uh, folks, remember ISF goes around the clock until for about another day and a half. So I uh, hope you'll join me staying up late for a few more sessions tonight before catching a little bit of sleep. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Jonathan and Niels for presenting at this session and uh, see, Thanks, you, see you later. Bye-bye.